and welcome to High School Physics Explained and today I want to talk about specific heat capacity. So you're making a pizza, you've got a base, you've got tomato base, you've got cheese and bacon and you put it in an oven at 200 degrees Celsius. Which of those substances will reach 200 degrees first? Well that of course depends on A, the amount of each of those substances you have and B, on the type of substance and that is it's related to the specific heat capacity. To help us understand let's have a look at this specific illustration. I have a beaker here of water and I, underneath it I place a Bunsen burner with gas and so of course energy is going to be transferred from the flame into the water. How much energy would I require if I want to raise it by one degree? Well of course that will depend on the amount of liquid so I'm going to require more energy if I have more liquid. But if I have a beaker let's say of oil and let's say it's the same volume as our first beaker then I'm going to probably need less energy to raise it by one degree simply by the fact that I have not got water here but I've got oil. And if I have the same amount of let's say a bar of iron I'm going to probably need a lot less energy to raise this to a temperature by one degree. So in essence that's what the specific heat capacity is. It's the amount of energy supplied or removed to change one kilogram of that substance by one degree. So it's going to be the same if we ignore the amount here and that's why we've got one kilogram here. So let's summarize that. So what do we need? We want the amount of energy and we're going to call that Q. We want to raise it by one degree so we're going to have our amount of energy per degree or per amount of temperature and of course per kilogram so we're interested in dividing it per unit mass. And so that becomes the value C which is called our specific heat capacity. If I rearrange that formula I get this formula Q equals C M delta T that is the amount of energy is equal to the specific heat capacity of my substance multiplied by the mass of my substance multiplied by the temperature. And so what we have here is a table of specific heat capacities and what we're interested in here is this particular column here because this is the correct SI unit and you can see various substances have specific heat capacities. Some substances have fairly low specific capacities 450 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius for iron something significantly higher for water at the liquid state at 4186. So if we go back to our illustration here, the specific heat capacity for water is 4182, the specific heat capacity for oil is 1670 and the specific heat capacity is 450. What does that mean? I need a lot more energy to raise this substance for every kilogram I have by one degree than I do for oil and you can see that iron doesn't need a lot of energy to raise it to one degree. Similarly speaking if I want this to drop amount, a certain amount of it let's say a degree it's going to release only 450 joules. If I want this to drop by a degree I'm going to release significantly more energy 4182 joules for every kilogram. How does that play out though in everyday sense? So let's look at two examples that gives you hopefully a better understanding of specific heat capacity and in particular we're going to look at water. Well water is used of course as a coolant in engines. Why is that? Well water has a fairly high specific heat capacity 4182 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. Now, of course, in a radiator, you may have, let's say, five liters. So therefore, we have a mass of around five kilograms of water. Finally, we want the temperature to go from, let's say, 20 degrees, and we only want it to get to, let's say, 100 degrees. Why? Because we don't want it to go into a gaseous state. 
Now, because it's under pressure, we probably can go to a higher temperature here. But just for this example, let's say we only want an 80 degree change. Then the amount of energy required is going to be 4,182 multiplied by 5 multiplied by my change in temperature, which is going to be 80 degrees. And that is equal to 1,672,000 800 joules. That's a lot of energy. And that, of course, is going to be taken away from the engine. And so that's why water is used as a coolant. It can actually take a lot of energy before going into the gaseous state. So let's have a look at another example where water having a high specific heat capacity has an impact on us. So here we have the continent of Australia and we have a certain amount of energy falling on per square meter the same whether it's on the land on the coast or over water remember water has a high heat capacity and so if you were to compare the temperature increases over the water and over the land considering that they are all receiving the same amount of energy which one will increase the temperature the greatest well it's going to be much greater on the land because it has a lower heat capacity and so therefore with the same amount of energy since water has a high heat capacity it is only going to increase by a small amount in terms of temperature whereas the land having a lower heat capacity for the same amount of energy will have a much greater increase in temperature which means for example in summer it's going to generally be cooler on the coastline than inland, simply because you're going to have this temperature increasing on the surface, and that is, of course, is going to heat up the air above it. But what about in winter? Well, in winter, of course, it's going to be significantly cooler than the surrounding, and so what we're going to get is that the water will start to cool, but because of its high capacity, it's going to not necessarily drop in temperature too quickly. It's going to have a lower temperature drop. And so as a result, you're going to get a small drop in temperature. And so generally speaking, you're going to get water that is not going to be significantly colder in winter than if you compare it to the land situation. Again, a low heat capacity means the temperature will drop more quickly more significantly and therefore it's going to be colder in other words inland you're going to get extremes in temperature whereas on the coasts you're not going to get as many extremes again all has to do with the concept of specific heat capacity finally let's have a look at an example where we use this formula let's say cold water is at 15 degrees and it enters a heater and the resulting temperature you use is at 61 degrees now, assuming a person uses 120 kilograms of water, how much energy is needed to heat this water? Well, you need this formula. Q is equal to Cm delta T. Q, of course, is what we're after. So we'll write this down. Unknown. Our specific heat capacity is 4,182 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. Our mass, in this case, is equal to 120 kilograms and our change in temperature, our delta T, is the difference. That is 61 minus 15, which is equal to 46 degrees. And so therefore, 4182 multiplied by 120, multiplied by our change in temperature, which is 46 degrees, gives us a grand total of 2.3 by 10 to the power of 7 joules. That's how much energy is gone into the water. Now all of these situations that we're talking about here deal with substances that aren't changing state at all. So the energy putting in does not change whether a substance goes from solid to liquid to gas or any other way. That requires an understanding of latent heat and that will be the topic of our next video. I'm Paul from High School Physics Explained. I hope this has helped you. Please like, share and subscribe. Bye for now.